Tonight, the pause on AstraZeneca. Canada suspends the vaccine for anyone under 55. A rare but very serious uh, side effect has been seen. No cases in Canada, but a review of the risks. We are acting decisively. And the BC circuit breaker as cases climb across the country. Day one in a trial over the killing of George Floyd. No justice, no peace. The shade of your skin should be a death sentence. America is watching. Witnesses describe the last harrowing moments of his life. Plus the engineering feat that got the boat to float. It kind of dangled across the Suez Canal. So it was a very precarious salvage operation. The colossal rescue of the trapped Suez ship. CTV National News with Lisa LaFlau. Good evening. We begin tonight with a vaccine backed by solid science, yet hobbled again by confusing messaging. The latest change in the Canadian guidelines, no AstraZeneca for people under 55, all because of extremely rare cases of blood clots linked to the vaccine in Europe. No side effects have ever been documented in Canada. The eroding confidence in Europe, though, was enough for the provinces to hit pause here. Ottawa Bureau Chief Joyce Napier has the details. It was meant to be a confidence-boosting photo op. I received AstraZeneca today. But on the day Ontario's 65-year-old health minister got her first dose, Canada put a pause on AstraZeneca for younger people. There is substantial uncertainty about the benefit of providing AstraZeneca COVID-19 vaccine to adults under 55 years of age, given the potential risks. Those potential risks are blood clots that occur rarely, between one in a million to one in a hundred thousand cases, according to data from Europe, occurring primarily in women under 55. It's a very rare but potentially very serious adverse effect. I can't stress this enough. It is still very rare. Uh, but of course, we have to think about what is the risk of having an adverse event. The rare side effects typically occur four to 16 days after the shot. Shortness of breath, chest pain, leg swelling, persistent abdominal pain, sudden onset of severe or persistent worsening headaches or blurred vision, and skin bruising. Tens of millions of AstraZeneca doses have been administered globally. In Canada, so far, more than 300,000 with no cases of clots reported. Provinces are now following the advice of the National Advisory Committee on Immunization. And we are pausing to get more information to be able to offer detailed informed consent. PEI had started vaccinating people 18 to 29 with AstraZeneca. We acted quickly, uh, immediately pausing the administration of all AstraZeneca vaccine in the province. The Premier of Ontario going one step further. I'd, I'd rather wait, uh, it means a month or two months, for Pfizer and Moderna and, and J&J than uh, roll the dice on, on this uh, AstraZeneca. This latest pause in the AstraZeneca rollout may contribute to vaccine hesitancy, as Canada is expecting a shipment of one and a half million doses from the U.S. tomorrow. Lisa? All right, Joyce Napier on the new restrictions. And we'll talk more about AstraZeneca. But first, it is critically important to underscore the severity of the moment we're in right now. Across the country, 21 families are mourning the loss of a loved one today. And more than 4,500 people have tested positive. And here's the frightening part. Six provinces are seeing variants of concern go way up. BC was one of them. CTV's Mirella Fernandez with the inevitable consequences. A circuit breaker is now required to break the chains of transmission in our province. That chain grew by more than 700 cases in BC today. 321 of them, variants of concern. So for the next three weeks, there will be no indoor dining at restaurants, no indoor group exercise or faith services. It was entirely unexpected. Uh, I don't think we wanted to imagine that this could happen. And no skiing at BC's Whistler and Blackcomb Mountains, canceled at what would be the busiest time of the year. 
it's been massive. It's been devastating. I, I, I don't have big enough words to communicate what COVID-19 has done to the tourism industry. The higher COVID case count in B.C. comes right after March break. The premier says those between 20 and 39 aren't following the rules. My appeal to you is do not blow this for the rest of us. Do not blow this for your parents and your neighbours. For a fifth day in a row, Ontario reported more than 2,000 COVID infections. The province hasn't seen numbers like that since the end of January. Variants of concern are completely out of control. Ontario regions that had been in lockdown are gradually reopening, even though experts say the variant cases are doubling every 11 to 12 days. This is exponential growth. It won't stop. It will continue the way it is, and it is bound to all around the healthcare system. Alberta has the most variant cases in the country at more than 3,300. Ontario and BC are closing in on 2,000 each. Lisa. All right, Morella, some very sobering news again tonight. Dr. Abdi Sharkawi joins me for some perspective. And, Doctor, I mean, there is so much happening tonight, but let's start with the impact from this variant from BC right across the country. Are we at some kind of tipping point right now? We certainly are. We're seeing a trajectory that dwarfs anything we saw in the first two waves. And what's unique about this is because these variants are so much more transmissible. We're seeing a lot of younger people who are otherwise healthy becoming extremely sick and ending up in our ICUs. And that's something that's completely preventable if we do things the right way. So transmissible, but not necessarily deadly. I mean, if we look at the death toll month over month, it's still lower. They are more deadly. I think we're going to see the cumulative impact of that change when the numbers continue to go up. But even if people survive, being in an ICU, there is lasting damage that happens there, even if you're young and healthy otherwise. Mm, finally, you know, the other major headline, of course, pausing AstraZeneca. Just have to ask, what kind of assurances are there for those who have already had it in this country? I think people should take comfort in the fact that this event, if it is linked to AstraZeneca in terms of the clots, it is extremely, extremely rare the likelihood of having a severe outcome from COVID-19 far, far outweighs the likelihood of getting a reaction to this vaccine. So I think we should take comfort in that. Don't throw out the dose with the needle. All right, Dr. Sharkawi, as always, thanks for your insight tonight. Good night, Lisa. The dire scenario Dr. Sharkawi is alluding to is a shared view among medical professionals. Today, the director of the Centers for Disease Control delivered some hard truths during a White House briefing. I'm going to reflect on the recurring feeling I have of impending doom. We have so much to look forward to, so much promise and potential of where we are, and so much reason for hope. But right now, I'm scared. Right now, the U.S. is averaging about 60,000 new cases a day. That is up 10 percent in a week. There was more blunt talk today at one of the most high-profile murder cases in U.S. history, the trial for the police officer charged in the death of George Floyd started today. Protesters gathered outside the Minneapolis courthouse this afternoon, while inside, opening statements were laid out in front of the jury. CTV's Washington bureau chief, Joy Melvin, on day one, and a warning, the testimony is very hard to hear. For more than eight minutes, George Floyd's family and activists knelt outside the courthouse to show how long Officer Derek Chauvin pressed his knee on Floyd's neck. No justice, no peace. Chauvin is in the courtroom, but America's on trial. The trial's star witness is the video that sparked protests around the world, the prosecution playing it in full for the jury. Please, 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 please. Floyd crying out, begging for his life. It's difficult to watch, but crucial evidence for the prosecution, who says the time, the knee on the neck, was actually longer, nine minutes and 29 seconds. The man ain't moved yet, bro. Bystanders screamed at police he's dying and to get off a handcuffed Floyd. Uh, you'll hear that for yourself. Please, I can't breathe. Please, your knee on my neck. This was an assault that contributed to taking his life. 
But the defense says Floyd died of drugs and an untreated heart condition, insisting Chauvin was simply doing his job. Derek Chauvin did exactly what he had been trained to do over the course of his 19-year career. The first witness, a 911 dispatcher. Troubled by what she saw on a street surveillance camera, she called in a supervisor. I don't know if they had to use force or not. They got something out of the back of the squad, and all of them sat on this man. She even thought the screen was frozen because Floyd hadn't moved. It was a gut instinct of, in the incident, something's not going right. Chauvin faces two murder charges and a charge of manslaughter. He has pleaded not guilty. If convicted, he could face up to 40 years in prison. Lisa? All right, Joy Melbourne on day one of the trial. Today, three Ontario police officers were cleared in the death of a mentally ill man tased a dozen times in his own backyard. 30-year-old Clive Mensa suffered schizophrenia. Police responding to a call about a disturbance didn't call a crisis team. The Special Investigations Unit declared that despite, quote, the significant force used, it satisfied police action was not unlawful. Mensa's family is, quote, devastated by the ruling, saying Clive was alone, scared, and had done nothing wrong. Two of the three officers refused to cooperate with SIU investigators. There was nothing but cooperation in a massive effort to free the stranded ship blocking the Suez Canal. After six stressful days, it is on the move. CTV's London Bureau Chief Paul Workman on how the salvage teams pulled it off. It took a flotilla of tugboats and a lot of engineering head scratching to finally wrench the massive Ever Given out of its muddy resting place. Not to mention a little help from nature itself. Higher tides that come with a full moon. Enough to refloat the colossal beast and declare mission accomplished. Mashur! Mashur! Mashur is number one, chanted these Egyptian sailors. Mashur being the huge dredging ship that sucked up tons of sand around the ship's bow. More than just an aggravation, this week-long bottleneck jammed up a good deal of the world's container traffic, halting an estimated $9 billion a day in marine commerce. The potential for catastrophic disaster was uh, getting, I suppose, closer and closer the longer this ship stayed there. Every day it went on, the bigger the log jam grew, waiting to pass between Asia and Europe with the shortest route blocked by something akin to a giant beached whale. What we more or less did is we used the water power that was in the canal with the returning tide to push the vessel where we were pulling it. For a while this morning, it seemed as if high winds were pushing the ship back towards the banks. But soon enough, the Ever Given was free and on the move again, if just a week late. The ship, with its 20,000 containers, will be inspected before it's allowed to exit the canal. It will take at least three days for the backlog of carriers stacked up and waiting to make their way through, Lisa. All right, Paul. Absolutely fascinating outcome. Another traffic jam shut down the Trans-Canada Highway today in Alberta after a series of crashes, including a 70-car pileup. It was zero visibility. Truckers were up against it. Oh, it was really scary. I was just going to walk out and see what happened to my back to my trailer. And then all of a sudden, I got hit again. Oh, my God. One passing motorist caught this moment as a tractor trailer flipped. Are you okay? Yeah, I'm fine. But uh, the ambulance is coming. I called already 911. Oh, I don't need an ambulance. Huh? The truck driver managed to climb out on his own and amazingly... He was not seriously injured. Terrifying. Coming up, an update on the investigation into the BC stabbing spree. We are still in the early stages, and we may not be able to provide you answers at this time. The hunt for a motive as a community grieves. Plus, the midnight tee off as the UK gets back into the swing of things. Police in North Vancouver confirmed today the suspect in that stabbing spree on Saturday has no connection to the one woman killed or the six others wounded. 
The attack was random as it was cruel. Tonight, CTV's David Mulko profiles the traumatized. As the field of flowers grew, Caitlin Patterson and Callan Ashcroft grappled with the aftermath of the violence that hit so many they know so close to home. It really threw me for a loop. Like, I couldn't imagine that someone would do this to just such a lovely and incredible and kind person. To Shaloa Clausen, their former chemistry teacher, who posted this selfie from her hospital bed, then Monday returned to school for a visit to show everyone she was back. She's such a fighter and such a strong person. Suzanne Till, a single mother of three, one of five others also fighting. And I just want to convey to you today how utterly shocked and saddened our community is. That shock and sadness now turning to a search for answers, including why this man, 28-year-old Yannick Bandao, who has a criminal record for assault in Quebec, allegedly stabbed seven people Saturday, killing one. The accused was unknown and did not have any links to any of the victims. And the owner of the Montreal area gym where the suspect used to work out appeared to be equally stunned. Bandao Monday charged with second degree murder. We need to be able to talk to each other about it and we need to be able to support each other. As these two students now send their love and support to a favorite teacher who was always there for them. I mean, if it weren't for COVID, I'd love to just give her a huge hug. Just really want to thank her from the bottom of my heart. And as for the suspect today, he refused to come out of his cell. He's due back in court on Thursday. David Mulgo, CTV News, Vancouver. U.S. prosecutors today added the most serious charge yet in the criminal case against Ghislaine Maxwell. The new allegation is sex trafficking a 14-year-old girl to be abused by pedophile Jeffrey Epstein. Maxwell is accused of grooming and paying the girl in cash after each visit to Epstein's Florida home. The longtime Epstein confidant and sometimes girlfriend is in a Brooklyn prison right now awaiting trial on conspiracy charges. Still ahead, new details in the expanding investigation at a small town hospital. Police identify the victim an Ontario doctor is accused of killing. Rumors and wrong information is running rampant in the small Ontario town of Hawkesbury as the community continues to absorb the shocking details that one of its own doctors is charged with murder as investigators look into other deaths at the hospital. CTV's Annie Bergeron Oliver is in Hawkesbury tonight with what we do know. The details of the homicide investigation are sparse, but today police named the victim as 89-year-old Albert Poydinger from Point Claire, Quebec. They say he died at the Hawkesbury General Hospital on Thursday night, the same day a physician was arrested and later charged with first-degree murder. That's the one case that was laid with the uh, first-degree murder charge last week. At this point in time, though, the investigation continues. 35-year-old Brian Nadler worked at the hospital as an internal medicine specialist. Now police are investigating reports of a number of other suspicious deaths at the hospital. They won't specify how many deaths or when the patients died. But, uh, we're not going to go back, uh, you know, exactly and tell you exactly how long uh, we're looking back, but recent is recent deaths. The secrecy around the investigation has shaken the small town of just 10,000 people. Well, there's been a lot of talk. Phone's been ringing at home and we're all chatting about it, uh, about what's going on at the hospital. I have friends who work there, but everything's kind of hush-hush. I was in shock. I was, I was in shock. I didn't know. I didn't know what was going on. Ontario police will not confirm whether the victim was one of Dr. Nadler's patients. He is currently in custody and will be back in court next week. Annie Bergeron Oliver, CTV News, Hawkesbury. We have an update now on that volcano in Iceland that erupted last week. It's now getting a record number of visitors and also becoming the unlikely center of a massive social event. It was only a matter of time. Check out the hottest volleyball game ever. Thousands of people have been heading to the site outside Reykjavik since lava started flowing 10 days ago. 
The volcano had been dormant for 900 years. Well, it's wide awake now. Here is another example of a glow-in-the-dark competition. How about a round of golf? Under par and under the night sky. They rush to the golf course in Derby, England, exactly one minute after midnight as the country started easing some COVID restrictions. After the break, focusing on the long game. A whole new arena with guaranteed best seats in the house. We end tonight with the reimagining of how fans connect with their favorite athletes. With the in-person arena experience still sidelined by the pandemic, the Toronto Maple Leafs and the Raptors are connecting the diehards on a digital playing field right from their living room. CTV's Heather Butts on the winning formula. There's nothing quite like the energy inside a packed arena, and it's a feeling fans have not forgotten. The energy around the building, the buzz outside, you know, the Leafs Nation is such a passionate fan base. A passion he takes to heart. Jason Maslico bleeds blue, but COVID changed his game plan. It's been a, a big adjustment. Uh, you know, I'm unable to, you know, really have friends over to watch in the, in the, uh, in the basement. We've had to use, uh, you know, different social media apps to be able to re- interact with each other. There's a new way to keep that connection with even more fans around the world. Maple Leaf Sports and Entertainment has created a digital arena, putting sideline excitement in the palm of your hand. You know, you're part of the community. Your voice is going to be heard. Your cheers are going to be heard digitally. You can connect with alumni and personalities that we bring. It's touted as a second screen when fans are watching the Leafs or Raptors play. It even has game time trivia without the Jumbotron. A perfect challenge for Raptors fans like Brandon Craig, who commissioned this mural to fill the void. Every day I come downstairs, look at the uh, the painting behind me, and it fires me right up. And that connects, just like connecting with other fans. It warms my heart, you know? It's something that like we're both passionate about, even though I don't even know them. Now you can control the angle. Also getting in the game, TSN is letting the viewer call the camera shots on a new app. Another example of fan interaction. The energy that fans have, the enthusiasm, that's what sports is. It's passion, it's joy. Any way we can get people to maintain those feelings, uh, that means they stay connected. To their favorite team and community, even when the fans are away from the stands. Heather Butts, CTV News, Toronto. It's very cool. That's it for us tonight. I'm Lisa Laflamme. For all of us at CTV National News, thanks for watching. Good night. We'll see you again tomorrow. Canada's number one newscast for excellence in journalism. We begin tonight with breaking news. CTV National News with Lisa Laflamme winner of the Canadian Screen Award for Best National Newscast. Watch weeknights at 11.